Well, we're in the, on the University of Nottingham Innovation Park. This is the Sir Colin Campbell building, but most importantly, this is the technology demonstrator behind this very normal looking door. Well, you'll hopefully see when you get in, but it's a showroom for all of our latest inventions and innovations. We've brought them all into one place for you to see. Come on in. That colour was not chosen by me. This is a professional designer who's chosen this colour, and apparently it's very important. But welcome. So you, we're in a room here surrounded by about, I'd say, 20 or so of quite recent university inventions and innovation for arising from research projects in general, really. Before this room existed, you, all this stuff did exist. It wasn't quite as good looking as it is now, but you'd have had to have toured our campuses across Nottingham, and maybe you have to go to China for some of it as well. Could have taken you weeks or months to have a look at all of this. Now you can come in here, have a cup of coffee with me, and see it all in half an hour if you wish. We're really trying to attract companies in here, because a lot of these technologies are really looking for partners for us to develop further. Sometimes we're getting school kids, for example, groups of school kids who might be interested in coming to university in the future. Here we can show them what the end result of some of the research projects we do at university is. So we'll take anyone in here, all audiences really. Well, let's have a look at, let's start here. So this is a great project. This is a heart rate monitor. Okay, now at the moment this heart rate monitor, which I've just picked up here, is being used over at the Queen's Medical Centre in a pre-clinical trial on newborn babies. So the basis of it is that this light you can see, this green light, if we place that somewhere on my body, so we're going to use my forehead in this case, the blood underneath my skin is going to absorb some of that light and then that will, we can convert that using some clever technology into my heart rate, heart rate. So on the screen you can see just how excited I am to be being filmed at the moment. When a doctor's doing resuscitation on a baby, and about 10% of all babies require a bit of resuscitation at birth, so much more than you'd imagine. Little baby, doctor's got two hands, there's not a lot of room here. Stethoscopes are what we use generally to measure heart rate in the hospital, routinely. But imagine trying to use a stethoscope on a baby that might already be doing about 150 beats per minute and then trying to do resuscitation at the same time. So this type of technology is being used to make that whole process easier. Eventually this will be the size of a pound coin, wireless, so you can buy one and you can have it linked up to your iPhone and you can measure your heart rate doing whatever you want. If you watch Casualty enough on the television you'll have seen finger clips and earlobe clips which are basically shining green light right through an appendage Okay, now that doesn't work particularly well for babies because their fingers are very small and that sort of thing and they might not have very good blood flow in their extremities. This is doing the same sort of technique but it's just reflecting, so it's shining light in the skin and seeing what comes back, okay. When there's blood underneath that skin, some of that light is being absorbed and we're converting that to a heart rate. Well here's a microwave, we've all got one of these at home. I don't know what last thing you put in your microwave is, but we put some pretty strange stuff in microwaves at the university. We've got a couple of inventions here that are all about microwave processing, but more importantly, industrial microwave processing. So if I talk you through one specific example, perhaps that'll give you an idea about what microwave processing can do. Okay, so let's have a look at something called vermiculite. Now, if you're a gardener, you'll recognize this stuff. So this is often mixed with soil and it's a very good uh, water retaining piece of mineral. It's very, very light. So this, this probably weighs, I don't know, 100 grams, a couple of hundred grams. It's very lightweight. But it doesn't look like that when it comes out the ground. It's a natural mineral. It actually looks more like this. Now it comes out of uh, a few places in the world, but the main mine, the main source of this is in South Africa. So in order to turn the mineral from this quite boring flaky form, which has no commercial value at all really, into this what we might call exfoliated or puffed up form, it has to be heated rapidly, okay? And at the moment that's done in a furnace using a lot of gas or oil, up to around about 1,000 degrees centigrade, so it uses an enormous amount of energy. Now, some time ago we started working on a system to do that same process of turning it from this flaky material to the puffed up material using microwave energy. Now I think what we could actually do now is a practical demo to prove to you that it actually works. And we'll take some of the, more of this raw mineral. So this is slightly bigger pieces of the same material that I was just playing with. And we'll take it back over to a standard domestic kitchen microwave. I think this one is 850 watts. Don't try this at home. I mean that. And I think 50 seconds should do us. So what's happening in there is some very clever, well, some very fortunate microwave engineering, okay? 
if we just wander, whilst it's going, we wander back over to a really big piece of vermiculite. So this is a really massive piece of this same mineral. This is really made of two main components, okay? A mineral phase, which is a, a silicate type mineral, sandwich, a sandwich of that, and then there's a layer of water, and then another mineral, water, mineral, water, all in absolutely tiny, thin layers, okay? But it basically makes a sandwich. If you look really closely, you can actually see the layers here. Now, it just turns out, because that mineral phase is transparent to microwaves. So if you had a pure lump of that and uh, put that in a microwave, it would never get warm. But as you all know, the water heats extremely rapidly in a microwave. So what is the effect of that water heating quickly when the mineral doesn't? Well, it's quite dramatic. So what we have here is what a lot of people call exfoliated vermiculite or expanded or puffed up vermiculite, okay? So it's, it's a bit warm, but that's because there was water being heated up in it. People have been putting vermiculite in this type of uh, domestic oven or similar ovens to that for probably since the 1970s. But that is not a scalable process. No one is ever going to buy a thousand of those ovens and exfoliate material all day long, no matter how cheap labor is, okay? So the big leap, the where the research and science comes in is turning that knowledge, understanding how that puffing or exfoliation happens and turning it into a continuous process. So what you're seeing here in a slightly cut in half form, this is the bottom half and this is the top half, so this would normally be on top, is approximately what some industrial microwave processes can look like. So if I describe the main elements, what we've got here is a conveyor belt. So this is conveying the raw material in at one end, moving it through a system, to the middle, which is where we're applying a lot of microwave power, and that's coming in literally here. Okay, So we're setting up an electric field here that we want to do the puffing, the exfoliation. And then we're getting very, very quick expansion, and then the expanded material is coming off the end of the conveyor belt. Whilst it looks relatively simple, there's quite a lot of science that goes into designing these cavities, as we call them, to give us the exact conditions here that we want to do this exfoliation. A lot of people have got conservatories these days and often those conservatories get way too hot to actually use, all that sun beating in. So you think, well, how can we stop some of that heat coming in? Because I really like being in my conservatory, but I don't really want to put air conditioning in it, but I really would like to be able to use it in the summer. So this is a type of technology that's in development now that will react to temperature outside. So imagine when it starts to get warm outside, you'll start to get a tint on your glass or on a layer on top of your glass. So it'll get darker. The hotter it gets outside, the darker your glass will get. So that will stop some of that heat penetrating into your room. So you think, well, actually, is that the same as these reactive sunglasses that I've already got? Well, no, because they react to sunlight. Okay, so this, this building that we've built two sides of here is potentially the past here. Each individual dwelling has its own air conditioning system to try and keep it cool. What we're trying to move towards is, a, is, a, is replacing some of that air conditioning load with this what we call thermochromic window film technology, okay? So we're stopping some of that heat getting into the room by tinting the glass down purely based on temperature. So a good way of thinking about this is on a bright, cold winter's morning when you're trying to have your cup of coffee in your, in your conservatory, it will still be nice and bright because it's still cold outside so you can have a nice bright cup of coffee. But if that, if that was that photosensitive glass that's in your sunglasses, it would already be getting dark when it doesn't need to, okay? So it's a slightly different take on that type of approach. This is not just a showroom for actual inventions, okay? So it's all about knowledge transfer and about some of the really exciting stuff we do at the university and communicating that to people. So, very well-known project, I like it myself, the periodic table of videos. So we've just put an installation of that in here. There's some guy here, he's got more hair there. No, he hasn't. Different style, maybe. He's a good-looking chap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what we've done here is just enabled the, the, the system here working in this environment so people can come in and if they haven't heard of the periodic table of videos they can soon have a, a bit of a play around with it and then go home and play with it some more. But it, it's a really good example of knowledge transfer generally. It's university scientists speaking about what they do in a really accessible way. And really that underpins this whole room. We're not trying to blind anyone with science here. We're trying to make things accessible and simple for people to understand. If people can't understand it, how can we possibly sell it or commercialise it or make money out of it or help change people's lives? It's just not going to happen. So we try and keep things nice and simple and accessible here. Yeah.